Have you heard the words Fetty or Fetty Mint? You probably have if you've been on Bitcoin Twitter, you've seen these words around, but if you're like me, you haven't taken the time to really understand what this thing is. You hear some words about federations and Chami and Mint, XYZ thing. Well, I got the perfect person to come on and break down some of these ideas and what they mean. I got Cody Lowe on the podcast. He is the head of product and developer support at Fetty. But first, what is up, you beautiful people? Welcome back to the Built on Bitcoin podcast, where we cover all the innovation happening across the Bitcoin ecosystem. And that means that we treat all the different ecosystem partners as first-class citizens here. Bitcoin L1, Lightning, Rootstock, Stacks, Ordinals, Fetty, whatever it is. I want to talk to the builders doing cool stuff across the ecosystem. So with that said, like I was mentioning, I had Cody Lowe on the podcast and we cover a ton of different topics. We cover what is Fetty Mint, which is the protocol. We cover what is Fetty, which is this company that's building applications on top of it. We cover as a new dev, which he is, uh, what's it like currently as a Bitcoin developer kind of in the different pockets of the ecosystem that exist. And if you want to get into the game, how he might do it and where's the good spots to uh, to uh, learn the basics. We cover quite a bit about federations, which is core to the Fedimint protocol. And for the most part, they get a bad rap. We hear about it with things like Liquid and they have this federated network. But I think you'll come away from this episode having a newfound respect for the design space that exists within federations. So we learn about that, things like second and third party trust assumptions. I think you're like this one. So let me not blabber any further and let's jump right into this episode with Cody Lowe, the head of product and developer support at Fetty. Welcome to Built on Bitcoin. Cody, what's up, my man? How are you? Doing fantastic. I'm so excited for this. Uh, me as well. Uh, a ton to talk about. We're going to talk a lot about Betty Mint for sure, but uh, also Bitcoin development. I, I was You came on my radar because I went to the Bitcoin Plus Plus event and amazing event. It's, it's my first developer-focused event I've been to. Besides that, it was just the main conference. And the signal in Austin that weekend was insane. So... I guess, first of all, just thank you to you, Nifty, whoever uh, put that together. Fantastic job. Yeah, totally. I mean, so Bitcoin Plus Plus is run through Base 58. Um, I've, so just a little background on me, right, is that I was in the Marine Corps. I was an infantry officer. Um, I finished up active duty about two years ago. And then after that, while I was doing my master's um, in computer information tech, um, I started teaching Bitcoin just because like I love this stuff and like kind of one of the best ways to learn about something is to teach it to other people. And so I was really teaching through uh, Palm Script, of course. So, like I don't remember if you guys remember that or whatever. I don't know if they're still around, but for it was like a year and a half or so of doing that. And then um just as I like kind of went specifically into Bitcoin development, um teamed up with uh, Lisa. I was in her first cohort cohort that she did for base fifty eight where she teaches like Bitcoin protocol development. And then for like the next year was uh like helping with her on that. Right. And so like, you know, I still like try to support her as much as I can for these things. One of the things that she does is she throws these Bitcoin plus plus conferences and it is like by developers for developers, like focused on like the really amazing things happening in Bitcoin. And the reason why she started it was because she was sick of people saying things that things aren't happening in Bitcoin or like everything is happening in all these other ecosystems. And it's like, no, we're going to put the developers front and center. We're doing really amazing things. And so like, for example, like the first Bitcoin plus plus a conference in Austin was where we did the first Simpy Mint, which is Fediment. We'll be talking about that later. Is a federated Chami Nikash system on Bitcoin. And um, because it's got like its kind of internal consensus, you can add interesting contracting systems. So like, for example, I, I know that you're involved on like the stack side of things is that you could implement Clarity, for example, as like a module. And so the contracting system within the Fediment that you deploy would be the Clarity contracting system. Um, we did Simplicity. What was the first use of Simplicity, which is Blockstream's uh, like new scripting language for Bitcoin. Um, we were able to implement that there. And that's like one of those amazing things where it's like, you know, we can play with this cool stuff. And it's like, it really only happens at places like Bitcoin plus plus. And so there's going to be another Bitcoin plus plus that's um, in Austin next year, but the upcoming one is going to be October 7th in um, uh, Berlin. 
right? And that's going to be focused on Nix. And so I don't know if you want to go down the Nix rabbit hole, but like Nix is like very, very interesting for security conscious uh, Bitcoiners, right? And so it'll be super exciting. Very cool. Very cool. We're, we're quickly opening a can of worms. I have to stop myself from opening. Um, but I want to I want to touch on the development side of things because mm-hmm. as you mentioned, I started as a Stacks person and I've been orange pulling myself over the past two years and I'm much more orange than I've ever been. And I'm o- it's only increasing in shade. So something that's very interesting to me when I look at the ecosystem, especially bracketed against Solidity EVM chains, is that you learn once and you get exposure to like five different chains that have some level of traction. In mm-hmm. Bitcoin, it's much more fragmented. So you get like the yep. core people that know script, and then I'm not even sure what you know what Lightning builds on, and I keep hearing Rust is a thing. But then if you go after that, it's like Rootstock is Solidity, Liquid is whatever they use, and then Stacks is Clarity, and who knows where else is coming. So like being a Bitcoin dev feels very messy depending on where you're building. So I'm curious, as someone who's gone through the base 58 case, 58 course, which is like more protocol stuff, uh, how do you view the like landscape of being a Bitcoin dev at, like currently? Yeah, totally. I mean, one of the, so kind of like the thing for Bitcoin, right, is that like over time, everything collapses into Bitcoin, right? And so this is kind of sort of the way I think about these things of like, you can be doing whatever development sort of stuff you want is like, eventually this will be the global reserve currency payment layer for the entire world, right? Of like, you know, AIs um, using Bitcoin in order to like complete payments between each other, like all the sorts of stuff like that, right? And so eventually over a long enough time period, everything's going to collapse into Bitcoin, right? And so for all this other stuff, like it doesn't matter what you're interested in of like, you know, you could be like a Rust programmer or a Go programmer, or you could be a Solidity programmer and all this kind of stuff. Like one of the things that's really exciting about um, like the things that Casey enabled through Ordinals is that because you can basically use the Bitcoin blockchain as blob space, all of the layer twos that are being developed on all these other chains or whatever, they just need a place to have the data availability layer and for the uh, dispute resolution, right? So like to publish the validity proof, that kind of thing. And so eventually you begin to put all of those layer two things and all of those Solidity compatible EVMs and all that sort of stuff or whatever, you don't need a token for any of that stuff, right? Is you just need Bitcoin. And so over time, like a long enough time, everything collapses into Bitcoin, right? And what's cool about Bitcoin is that they're just getting the tools available now in order to be able to do some of this more out there development, right? So for example, within Fediment, so just to kind of uh, bracket this because we haven't covered what Fediment is before. So Fediment is something that I'm a contributor to. Um, it's an open source protocol of building federated Charmini eCash on Bitcoin, and we'll go through each one of those. I'm also the head of developer support for Fedi, which is a company building a federated operating system on top of uh uh, Fediment and the Bitcoin protocol, right? Um, we'll go into all of those in time. But so, for example, one of the things that Fediment does is that because you're using this um, like very small deployable federations, is that it's got this very sensible module system. Is that you can add modules or you can add some of the complex cryptography and the smart contracting and all those kinds of stuff and deploy them at these kind of smaller levels in order to play with these things, right? So, like Fediment, the reference implementation that. Um, uh, like if you're a developer and you'd love to contribute to Fediment, we do all sorts of really good onboarding, that sort of thing, right? And like everyone's always welcome there. We'll always find work for you. We'll always find stuff to like help you upscale so that you can uh, be a better contributor in the eco- Bitcoin ecosystem. Is that Fediment is written in Rust, but there's like all sorts of fancy cryptography and stuff that we can do that we can't do because uh, if you're going to try to do this on Bitcoin, because you have to um, change the global consensus of everything, the Bitcoin chain, right? Within the federations, you just have these like medium to large size federations or small federations even where you can have cons- a distributed consensus and you can add and remove modular components to it, right? So for example, one of the things of the differences between like Fediment transactions versus Bitcoin transactions is Bitcoin, there's inputs and outputs, and then uh, that's kind of the whole structure for it. The fundamental structure within Fediment's distributed consensus system is inputs, outputs, and a single snore signature. And the reason why is because we're doing something called cross input signature aggregation, which is some fancy cryptography, which we'd love to get into Bitcoin, requires some changes or whatever. But because we're doing these smaller federations, we can play with these more out there cryptography, right? And so like there, we're testing out all of the cross input signature aggregation libraries and the cryptography that's eventually going to get deployed into Bitcoin and Rust Bitcoin and those sorts of things, right? And so all of these tools are, are there now. Like it took a while, right? But like now we have these modular systems in order for you, you can like, deploy federations or you could deploy with side chains or you could deploy with rollups and publish using the ordinal system right it's like for a long time everyone was like oh i can't do this on bitcoin right now it's like yeah there's a way that you'll be able to it's like give it a couple of years right and now those couple of years have passed and the, all of the tooling is there and all of it's available and so like you know come to the bright orange side of things of like come build on bitcoin right what 100 percent. that's that's super interesting okay before we dive into fediment i'm I, one more question on the developer side which is um if you are new, because you've only been here a couple of years, so like that's, yep. you know, 
big transition. Would never have guessed that you worked a developer for a long time by your passion, but also that your depth of knowledge on site when I saw you. Uh, so when it comes to, let's say you hear this podcast by the end, they're like, I'm fired up. Cody's, you know, the guy I want to build a Bitcoin. If you're, let's say you're no, if no dev experience, you're at zero or very little and you've done some HTML stuff. Is base 58, the place you would send people still, or where's the best place to start if you want to get involved? So just let me talk about kind of like macro level and then we'll move down into like very, very specific things. Right. And so like, like I said, I was like, I was an infantry officer in Marine Corps. Right. It's like, I still do reserves. Like I was active duty for that one. Like, you know, I was like a rock eater. Right. Is that like, but one of the things coming into Bitcoin where but something that makes the Marine Corps really, really special from, among all of the services is that in Marine Corps, there's this culture of every Marine or rifleman. Right. Is it? everyone knows why they're here and the reason why they're here is because there's some 18 year old who's going to be jumping in a foxhole and he's got three guys behind him uh, like if you're a cook if you're a pilot if you're a lawyer if you're a supply guy or anything the reason why you're here in this organization is to support that guy and so you have to understand his role and you have to understand how you can best support him right and you eventually end up seeing this as like um like most stark in for example like the differences between uh navy and marine pilots in terms of close air support so close air support is like if you're flying jets or anything like that or you're flying helicopters, when you get really, really low to the ground, like really, really close, then the quality of the differences between the Marine versus the Navy pilots is enormous. And the only difference in their entire training is that the Marine pilots, after they graduate Naval Academy or they uh, go through officer candidate school or whatever, they spend six months at the Marine Corps basic school where they learn to be a provisional rifle platoon commander. And so they learn how to do the job of the guy that they're going to be supporting. So eventually when they go off and they're a pilot or anything like that, they know how to speak to that guy. They know how to communicate with him. They know like his struggles. They know how to uh, like what he's going through or whatever. And they can think through his perspective, right? So coming into Bitcoin development, kind of into the Bitcoin scene or whatever, is that like whatever you can do, try to get into a place where you can play with the dev side of things, right? Because the most important people in this industry are the developers, are the open source contributors, right? And so regardless of what you end up doing, you could be a product manager, you could be like a writer, you could be like a podcaster or anything like that, right? Is that take some time to actually try to do their job and build something on Bitcoin as a developer, right? So that's like sort of macro approach for these things. So like, how did I do that, right? Is that like, you know, I like, uh, I had the GI Bill so I could go back to school, but also like the thing that I did was I found people in Bitcoin who were trying something new and really supported them for doing that because while someone's trying something new and they don't know whether or not it's going to be successful or whatever, they're really willing to help you help them make it a success, right? So for example, like starting to on the pop course, right? It's like I took Pomp's first, uh, it was the second cohort that he did for it, right? I took that just in order to meet other Bitcoin people because I'd never met anybody for that one. And then I was, while I was doing it, helping the guys who were running it. And at the end of it, they said like, hey, you seem to know a lot about this stuff. Could you come back and you could teach, right? And that was because it was something new. It was, there was a lot of opportunity there or whatever. Right. And like, I was not a developer by any stretch of the imagination at that point. Right. But like, I was really interested and I could contribute or whatever. So like I did that. Right. And then during that period of like a year and a half of like, this is why it's like, Hey, you teach with these people. We taught like 2000 people or so. Right. And so now I'm at the point where it's basically, there's a ton of people who moved out of the legacy financial industry into Bitcoin who kind of like came through something where I got to meet them. Right. And so basically everybody in the industry, I ended up knowing. Right. And so that's like one element of it, of like, if you can do something like putting yourself in a position like that, whatever, where it's like, you get to learn a lot and you get to meet a lot of people and you get to kind of do this stuff all the time or whatever, that's one element of it, right? And also just getting to know the developer side of things as well. Then with Lisa, um, so Lisa, uh, like absolutely amazing person, like probably the single most important person in like my development as a developer, right? Of that, she was a core lightning, contribu uh, core lightning contributor at Blockstream and she was trying this new thing where she really enjoys teaching. And so she started a school or whatever and like her first class, right? And so like at the time I was actually on activation um, handling the um, Afghanistan withdrawal, right? Um, for uh, resettling refugees. Um, but so I didn't know whether or not I was going to make it, right? But I was like, hey, I basically just put up the money for it. And I was like, I'm just going to figure this out. I'm like, I'm going to figure out a way that I can do this thing because I was like, this is an opportunity for me to spend a ton of time with a really good developer. And like, if I blow this out of the park, then maybe she'll like spend more time with me and help me like, and my grow as a developer and those kinds of things. Right. And so when people are trying new things, they're really looking for people who can like help them out. Right. And just like take a chance on them and all that kind of stuff. And that's the place where if you kind of put yourself there, you're going to, uh, you're going to do a lot. Right. Cause like after doing that with Lisa, I ended up being a TA for her. I ended up getting to meet a bunch of other Bitcoin developers, right? Because I'm like going to Bitcoin plus plus and all those kinds of things with her, right? In order to help things out. 
like that's kind of a way like as you start doing these things right so like sort of three elements of this thing is that you really want to know what it's like to be a developer and there's tons of ways to do that it's like for example anybody who's listening to this podcast who wants to come to the fediment discord like we do tons and tons of onboarding right of like if you're a newbie if you don't have the experience that you need or whatever right that's totally fine we will help you find other projects because fediment sort of touches everything in the bitcoin ecosystem that's fun and cool and new right like we use miniscript like we're doing taproot stuff we're um we're doing like more advanced con contracting that distribute systems uh cography like all that sort of fun stuff right but there's also a ton of like education aspect for it right and so just please come to fediment like we'll help help find you a place where you can like start contributing on the open source side there's that that element and then the second element is putting yourself in a position where you can meet a ton of people and also like learn on the process, right? Just because like, you know, you don't like now at, I'm at the point where I basically know everybody across the different industries, right? But when I met them, it was like they were coming into the industry. Like I remember one of the first classes that I taught with Pop, right? Of like, I was showing people how a um, Bitcoin wallet worked and I couldn't understand why my address kept changing. Right. As like, and it was like, oh, every time I send money, there's the address changes, whatever, what happened to it? Like, I didn't understand hierarchical deterministic wallets, right? And the wallet is a, a collection of addresses, right? Of like, you know, it's like at the time, it was just, I was just trying to learn as much as I could and like put myself in a position where I could learn stuff, right? And then the other one is like, there's going to be a bunch of people in this industry who are like trying new things. It's just like, be the first money for that person or like be a beta tester for them or like put yourself in those ones or whatever because it's very hard to start something new and people are really really grateful when you take a chance on them and also give them feedback right so that's like developers coming into the industry but uh three ways i think are like very productive for you to sort of interact that's that's perfect yeah it's also interesting the in my own journey when i try and grok an idea if i have to teach it like make a video on it oh my god i spend 10x more time trying to break down the concepts in a way that I understand and now do the hits for me first before yeah, I feel right. like I'm down camera and, and do that. So I'm sure you accelerate the learning, you know, astronomically about having to get in front of cameras and whatnot. Yeah, like, yeah totally. Whack right. poetically about whatever it is you're teaching. Um, the cohort thing yeah. I like too, and you mentioned the Fetty Discord. There's also a Twitter and GitHubs. Yep. Yeah. If you're trying to find specific, them, like, sorry, yeah. specific ones, uh, there's the Fediment Discord, right? Where we do a lot of like new contributor onboarding. Like we have dev calls on Tuesdays. We do white paper Wednesdays where we do some of the more like theoretical things of like going, like I just published a tutorial to Replit on Shamir secret sharing and distributed key generation where it's a uh, kind of fancy cryptography, but like we come through it from a very um, like approachable uh, manner for that. And then on Thursdays, we do deep dives into the Fediment code base, right? And so like somebody who's a subject matter expert and has written some of this code, like just goes instead of like coding during that period, they're just improving the documentation, asking, uh, getting asked questions or whatever by people coming on board or whatever. It's a very good way to like introduce yourself to those things. In terms of overall Bitcoin protocol development, like Base58 remains the single best uh, like mechanism for doing that. Is like Lisa is an unbelievable teacher, right? And she's got a bunch of resources available online, so definitely go through her. And then um, we're also doing a lot of experimentation on Fedi side. And so we just released Fedi Alpha, which is like kind of the first vision of the federated operating system for like it uh, It's it starts out right now as kind of like a Bitcoin and Lightning wallet where we're using this federation model underneath, but it's eventually going to be much, much, much more as we stand out the federation idea. And we're using MutinyNet for that, which is like a hosted test network. And so you're interoperable with Mutiny while you're doing this, which is another like really privacy focused Lightning wallet. And um, so you can start playing around with that. You can build uh, build applications with that one. Any of those communities are like extremely, extremely open and like willing to help. And like, you know, like we are, we, have, we need so many more devs and there's so many people who are very willing to be patient and spend time and teach you to code and to kind of get you upskilled, right? Of just like every Bitcoin or developer, like we need more people. So like, please come join. Got it. Okay. And the, and la, la, I guess last question of, of the last question about developers is, uh, is so if you do, if you have some gumption, you do want to learn it, is there money on the other side? Because I think when people hear open source, they hear like if the like fight for scraps is kind of like the inherent mm -hmm. thought. Is that true? Or yeah. Is that not true? Um, I mean, you have to take advantage of the opportunities that are available, right? So for example, like um, one of the things is that you know, like when you're first coming into an industry and you don't have a lot of skills, like it's hard to monetize the skills, right? Because you don't have any, right? And so the way that you monetize that stuff is that you get paid with other things. You get paid with like, you know, getting to be around some of these best developers in the entire world, right? Is like, you know, like there, there's nothing better, right? Of like the reason why I was able to onboard so fast to the developer side of things or whatever is because I surrounded myself with these guys and like I wasn't getting paid for much of what I was doing for it, but... I did that but it's also like you know take advantage of the opportunities you have i can say right now is that there's more 
funding than ever in Bitcoin, right? Like OpenSats just raised like 10 million bucks, right? Um, Spiral is like giving out um, grants all the time, right? But like in order to kind of like cut your teeth and get sort of a track record and uh, get some like proof of work and proof of concept behind these things or whatever, like it's good to just kind of like start contributing to the communities. But there's, and there's always ways that you can monetize a lot of these things, right? I mean, like the first off is like, you know, there's very, very poor educational content around a lot of the more technical things. And so as you learn the technical things, learning in public and doing it in reproducible ways where you can have tutorials that you can then deploy, right? Like those are going to be absolutely huge, right? And people will definitely pay, pay money for those. Um, kind of the other thing for it is that um, in terms of like monetizing as you move along with these things, uh, there's like a bunch of different ways you can do it. So for example, like one of the things for AI for all hackathon that we're going to be late, we can talk about that later. Um, is that we're going to be doing bounties uh, bounties for that through Replit and also doing Bitcoin bounties. And so for those ones, it's like little snack prizes that you get of like, a, hey, here's like a small thing or whatever. And like maybe it's 100 bucks, maybe it's 500 bucks, maybe it's a thousand bucks or whatever it is, right? And like you can get basically just like um, uh, eat those as you're working or whatever. But kind of the way to approach it is just like when you start working on something as big as this, it's like the, I mean, the feeling like this, like I'm, I'm reminded of um, uh, Patton, Patton speech, right? Or I don't know if you've seen the movie Patton, right? But at uh, the beginning of the speech, he like talks with the third army and he's telling them like, hey, the thing that I'm giving you, he's actually quoting um, Henry V, the Battle of Agincourt, Brent Band of Brothers speech when he says this, right? Is that like the thing that I'm giving you is that 30 years from now, when we look back at this time, you're going to get to say that you fought with the third army, right? And like for us as Bitcoin developers, right? Is like 30 years from now, when we look back on this and like we brought property rights, like inviolable property rights to the entire world, right? Like, and your kid is talking to you about this and asking you, hey, what did you do during that period, whatever? Like, you can say something like, you know, like I was just making a paycheck or whatever, right? Or you can say like, hey, I participated in this. I helped make that happen. I helped build the software that's still being used today, right? And in the, by small way, being able to contribute to that thing. And so like in terms of the money thing or whatever, there's more money than there's ever been before. And we're looking for developers and there's more than enough people who are willing to give you some experience in order for you to start applying for these grants. Like I literally am looking out for grantees all the time, right? Through like the various uh, organizations that I work with. Like I'm always looking for people to give grants to. And so if you're interested in those things, like like come on board, we'll help you get some experience so that you can um, increase your grant application and get you a grant so you can work on a project. Then maybe that turns into a recurring grant or some sort of job at a Bitcoin company. Perfect. Love it. I think we're... Uh... I think we're converting some people right now with, with, with this little, with, with this clip. Okay. Then, uh, let's jump in then. We got a lot to discuss with Fetty Mint. Uh, I'm going to play the village idiot because I've heard these words before. I know roughly what a federation is. I've heard this Chalmian Mint thing a bunch of times. You know, big borders I respect, like Alex Gladstein said, this is, you know, super pivotal text. It's going to be very important for the population. Uh, but besides that, I've done zero deep dives. I barely know yep. the difference between Fetty and Fetty Mint. Um, yep. you, you've, you've expressed some of it here today. So I'm going to be the left curve guy, and we're going to try and keep it middle curve to hit the hardest amount of people. So I guess first question, just to delineate, most of the time I want to spend on Fetty Mint, which is the underlying protocol, but just mm -hmm. to bracket, what is the difference between Fetty and Fetty Mint? Yep, so Fetty Mint is an open source protocol building on top of Bitcoin. It's building a federated Chaumian e-cashed system on top of Bitcoin. There's no derivative token. There's no anything. It's just like the there's a, it's a federation aspect and there's this Chaumian mint aspect. And the problem when, so David Chaum, he invented mints, which is basically a way of running a bank where the bank is completely blinded to all of its users. The problem with this Chaumian mint system is that you have to trust the mint, right? And so the federation aspect of it is a way, how do we decentralize that trust slightly, right? So now we're making it in a Byzantine fault tolerant way where, for example, if you have a three of four um, federation, then one of those federation members can be actively malicious and trying to steal the funds and there's nothing he's able to do. Two of them collaborating together are able to, they, the protocol won't uh, progress, but they won't be able to steal the funds. You need to get the uh, threshold multi-sig in order to steal the funds, right? And so this is a way where you can take this Chaumian mint system, which is a way of having cryptographically perfect privacy, and combining it where the problem with that is that you have like the single issuer of the mint and you can federate that mint, right? So it's some of the trade-offs space for it. So in terms of the differences between Fetty Mint and Fetty is that Fetty Mint is this open source protocol building these federated Chami and eCash mint system on top of Bitcoin. Fetty is a company that's building on top of the Fetty Mint protocol in order to build 
what we're calling a federated operating system. And so the Fedi Alpha release is kind of the first glimpse of that. But basically, you can think about once these federations get deployed, and you've got tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of these different federations and different communities, federations of different sizes. The Fediment system is built using this module system. And so you can attach modules into this, right? And so the modules, for example, you can run like a social recovery scheme. Or you can do something like you could have hosted access to AI models or hosted access to data resources and those kinds of things, right? And so FedE is a front-end application that allows you to join multiples of these uh, Fediments and get access to the underlying resources that they have there of like splitting your funds across them or backing your data up across them. Like the way that we like to say this a federated offering system is a way for people to take control of their money, their data, and their digital lives, right? So I think like a good way to kind of think about this is um, what the most recent Ledger Recover issue. I don't know how uh, you've been following this, but basically what they added was that, hey, we're going to do a Shamir secret sharing, sh sharing scheme where the shares are going to get extracted off their device and get it backed up by third-party custodians, right? And fundamentally, like, you know, any, sel any self-custody scheme, resilience to you having an accident has to have some th threshold mechanism in order for your family to recover the funds at the end, right? So like, like, it's a really, really important point before you arrive at federations as like a solution to one of these problems. And I'll, I promise I'll be relating this back into Ledger as we talk about this, is that we start from the assumption that like, hey, Bitcoin is this really powerful tool for taking self-custody of your money. Okay, so you do that, you have a single-sig wallet and you like you are the only guy that knows that thing. You do it properly, you get a cold card, you like pound in the steel plates and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but the problem becomes like, hey, what if I like walk outside and there's an accident or whatever, like I fall in a pool and I don't know how to swim or like I, you know, there's like an accident in some way or whatever, right? It's like my coins are gone, right? Is that any self-custody solution resilient to you being in an accident implies some sort of recovery mechanism that can be met outside of yourself, right? And so what a lot of people do is like, oh, hey, I'll give my key as a backup to somebody else or whatever. Well, now they own your Bitcoin just as much as you do, right? Is like this is the way that works. So kind of the gold standard for this is that you want to have some sort of threshold multi-sig mechanism, right? Where it's like my wife, my kids, and my um, lawyer, and somebody from my office who I trust is also a Bitcoiner or whatever, right? They hold different pieces of this thing, and I'm trusting them while I'm alive not to collude in order to recover the funds. But after I pass or after I'm in an accident or let's say that I lose my key or something, they can co coordinate in order to recover my funds, right? And so this is kind of the intuition that a lot of people have is that, if I take self-custody of my Bitcoin, then what if I'm in an accident and I lose it? Or what if I just break my phone or something like that, right? I don't trust myself to be the only custodian of these things. And so currently there's no real good option for this. And what they do is they just give it to a third party, right? Either through like Binance or Coinbase or whatever it is, right? Is that so Fediment is a model where basically you can use second party custody, right? The problem with Ledger of extracting the shares and giving them to these third party people or whatever is not that you shouldn't be doing some sort of threshold backup mechanism for your key, right? The problem is who they gave the shares to, right? people who should be holding on to my shares are like trusted people who I know are not going to try to collude against me. But in the event that I have an accident or something like that, they can collude in order to help my wife recover my funds, for example. Right. And when we're talking about deploying self-custody solutions in sec uh, all, like all across um, like the global South and like Africa and Latin America and those sorts of places, right. Is that there's not even the infrastructure in order to get them hardware wallets. Right. Like, you know, they don't have a solution right now. Like most of these crypto adoption metrics that people come is that basically they're just using Binance, right? Is that we need some sort of scaling solution that is going to allow us to give them some sort of better mechanism than a third party custody system. And so Fediment for us is a second party custody system where you can go to any of these communities, you can set up a federation of trusted uh, community members, right? And they, all they have to run is like a Bitcoin node and a little bit of software on the side of it and basically just keep it watered with like food and uh, sorry, with them. Um, uh, energy and um, uh, hard drive space, right? And once you have that set up, well, now you have a robust backup mechanism so they can onboard everybody else in their community, right? And so now when these guys are coming to Bitcoin, they don't have to come through uh, like Binance or they don't have to come through like this self-custody system where they don't trust themselves. And so, you know, they're writing down on a piece of paper and someone steals a piece of paper or something like that, right? It's like you get this robust out of the box, really resilient backup solution for social recovery. And then you start from that observation. This is like where Fediment kind of grows out of is that so Fediment itself is you deposit into the Federation some Bitcoin on chain and you get issued these eCash notes. And the eCash notes is like cryptographically perfect privacy, right? So now the problem becomes I'm only interoperable with my mint, right? This would not be a su successful solution except for Lightning is that basically Lightning becomes the light, uh, rails between all of these different people. So the experience that I have of using Fedi, the application, is that I'm just paying lightning invoices. On the background, 
what's happening is there's eCash payments going back and forth. And I'm actually paying Lightning Gateways. The Lightning Gateway receives the eCash notes and they do the Lightning payment on my behalf or they receive Lightning and they issue eCash back to me or whatever, right? The experience that I have is that the Bitcoin is entirely abstracted away, right? But I get this really good privacy. I get this really good control of my life, my data, right? And then I can put that within like a second party custody solution, right? Like, so uh, I, I hope that kind of covered like sort of the Fediment protocol layer of these things. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try and rehash what I heard to make sure that uh, I understand. Mm-hmm. So I think the first thing you touched on was self custody, and most people yep. do single sig for the most part. I, I know I do. I have my ledger. I'm not using ledger recover. It's just if I lose my shit, it's gone. Like it is what it is. And as my bag increases, that becomes more of a risk for me. So there's other you need to you need to diffuse that in some way to so that. If you have an accident, you know, God forbid, that that's just not, you know, a way. So it can go to your family or you can recover it in some way, which opens up a whole design space is what I'm hearing. So Ledger Recover is one where you can send it to these different trusted entities. They have to KYC. You you, you assume they're good, good actors. So, you know, you plug in your email, you get your stuff back. Perfect. Uh, the part I'm, I, I want to get some clarity on, you mentioned second versus third party. So I've never really yep. heard those terms in that way before. So the way I'm hearing it is second party is you know the individual members more clearly. So it's either trusted parties or individuals. And third party is I trust an entity. It's kind of mm-hmm. faceless, but I do trust the ent- entity or the brand. Is that the way to think about second versus third party? Yeah, totally. Is that second party is like your local community, right? Of like the reason why I feel comfortable sharting my um, Bitcoin key between uh, these different uh, people, these different custodians is because... I keep them honest via social pressure. I see them every single day. It's not like they're going to rug, like my wife is not going to rug me and run away, right? Or even if she did, she would have to get the collaboration of my mom and three of my Bitcoin friends who are also part of this like uh, federation that we're doing, right? Is that like the thing keeping these guys honest is social community pressure, right? And so in certain places, like, uh, you know, like most of the um, most of the Western world is that this is not as big of a deal. In the like, global South, they have these high trust communities, right? And so they already do this, where basically you already have these community custody models, right? Where you have trusted members of the community who are custodying on behalf of these people. This is basically fitting into that and giving them access to really, really powerful, inviolable property rights um, uh, using Bitcoin, doing the same model, right? And so what's really cool about this is that why we call it like Fediment, like Bitcoin, uh, well, called Fedi and Fediment can be Bitcoin adoption technology, right? Is because we can show up at any of these different communities all across the global south or anywhere in the world, and we can say, hey, if we can get like seven of you, right, who are like already diehard Bitcoiners, you guys are on your own nodes, you guys are good security practices and all those kinds of things, we can set up running Fediments alongside their nodes, and then they can run the Federation, and now they can onboard everybody else in their community, right? And so when I'm like, like orange pilling someone and trying to get them on board, I don't have to send them to Coinbase, I don't have to send them to Binance or whatever, right? Like I can invite them into my Federation, and they immediately get this robust backup solution in the event that they um, pass they get this really, really, really um, modular platform where you can, through Fediment modules, you can extend the uh, protocol in order to do all sorts of other stuff. So like one of the really cool things you can do is imagine each of these uh, federations, and like we're already working on this, is um, each of these federations becomes like a stratum V2 distributed mining pool, right? And so the payouts go to the federation and because the federation receives it on chain, they can issue the e-cash notes after the uh, they do the claim. You don't have to do the current, best sort of model for getting paid out of that you get paid um, to the on-chain address and then you have to wait 100 blocks and then you open a lightning channel and then you do the payments over lightning, right? Is that because you just deposit directly into the federation, right? You can issue the eCash notes directly, right? And so it's pretty cool as they do these things. And then another thing you can do, for example, is running DeFi pools. And so uh, Fedi, for example, has stability pools and we're going to be using these things like over collateralized lending within these uh, pools because like these, a lot of these DeFi protocols, they don't really work without like sufficient liquidity, right? right? And so federations are kind of a trade-off aspect of this one that you can get access to a larger liquidity base of your like entire pool in order to not have a lot of slippage while you're doing this trading, right? But the trust assumption of the federation is both a benefit and a trade-off and a, a, a negative, right? Of the negative of this is that, oh, hey, this doesn't scale. You can't get this to mil- a federation to like serve a million users or whatever because the trust assumptions are associated with it, right? But that also means that, hey, this is a naturally decentralizing force, right? Is that as federations grow to a sufficient size where it starts to feel like third party custody as opposed to second party custody, well, now some of those Bitcoiners break off and they start their own federation, right? And so it kind of like distributes, it's a Bitcoin adoption technology in the way that we want to distribute the um, Bitcoin and like the way that we're custodying Bitcoin all across the world, right? So pretty cool. Interesting. Yeah, I can definitely see why now Fedibit's been 
hard to grok because the federation is so important. Yep. Uh, and what you do in the federation is a whole different design space. Mm-hmm. Make sure I get it. Is so Fedimenta second party federations would liquid be third party kind of by definition in the way they're doing it? Yeah, that's the way to think about it, right? Is that, you know, Liquid, I think, like, I don't know who all the functionaries are. I think, like, OKX is one, or I guess OKCoin is one, Blockstream is one, um, Wiz from mempool.space is one, uh, there's a couple other or whatever. Like, you know, I've met, like, two of those people, right? And, like, they seem like great guys or whatever. But, like, you know, if they get subpoenas, then <laughs> that's, like, you know, that's probably my font gone, right? And so yeah. um, what's nice about that, right, is that, like, uh, you know, for the second party custody for these things or whatever, right? It's like social sanctions for these things. And what's also nice about that is that you basically, like, you know, there are models where you can monetize the federations, right? But like fundamentally out of the box, the way that FedMint works is that, um, uh, what's it called? You're not paying the, uh, you're not paying them, right? Is that the act, the person, people that you're paying are the lightning gateways for facilitating your payments is that you're not paying the federation guardians. The federation guardians are just acting as basically multi-sig custodians, right? And they're not, uh, they're not getting paid. Right. And so versus like on the liquid side or whatever, right? Like you're basically paying these guys. Right. And like that's the thing that keeps them honest is that like, hey, this is like a service and we're making money off this thing. And as long as we're making money, then like this is a good thing to continue going. But like maybe the pie gets so big or whatever that they want they want to run away with the funds, or maybe like the government comes after them, something like that. Right. Um, but on the Fedmin side, right, is that because it's my local community, right? Is like the reason why these guys are running this thing is because in the event that I have an accident or whatever, then they can help my wife recover my funds. In the event that they have an accident. I can help them recover their funds, right? Um, but and also just like a way that we can kind of like pool access to resources. So, for example, one of the modules that like I'm currently working on is basically hosted AI access, right? And so federations are going to if you just have like one guy who's got like a graphics card or like a suite of graphics card or a data center or anything like that, right? Is that like the federation can like gate access to that through lightning payments, right? And so now it's like, hey, I I can give my my old local community they can be running a Nostra relay or they could be running like hosted AI um, on this one where it's like instead of going all the way to third party open AI, it's always going to stay here and they have the guarantees that it's going to be like, hey, it's just me running the model, right? So like in the event that like your data leaks or whatever, right? Like you can go down the street and come to my house and like you know me, right? It's not like oh hey like open AI made a mistake and they actually accidentally leaked all of everybody's conversations or whatever and they're doing that for like five days or whatever and it's just like oops sorry my bad. Right, <laughs> like I live seven thousand miles away, and you have no mechanism for uh, got it, uh got like it. dealing. Right, hmm. this is super super interesting. So it, it's something I haven't really thought about. So and something you said, you know, everyone knows blockchains don't scale. Like they're not meant to by their nature. And yep. you mentioned federations also don't scale. Where at some point the federation becomes second party to like third party quasi ish, and the bigger they get, the more they feel that way. So that's interesting, and the. You know, in Bitcoin, the incentive is economic. So you're yep. trying to, you know, spend electricity, get some Bitcoin. That's that keeps everyone uh, aligned. This is moving from something economic to something social by its very nature. Yep. Uh, and obviously, because we're in this space, like incentives are everything. So, yep. how how do you guys think about like if you're trying to build a federation or onboard new members to it? What does like governance look like and that kind of thing? And how do you guys do that from like, uh, whether it's top down or bottom up? Like, how do you think yep. about that? Totally. So the way that we're building it is basically when you do set up one of these federations out of the box, right? You're making it Byzantine fault tolerant. And so like the more technical side of things, right? Is that you want this federation to be three M plus one and M is the number of malicious people, right? And so you want like a three of four federation in the, so one person can be malicious and one person gets compromised or whatever, like they can't steal everybody else's funds, right? Or if you're like, hey, I don't trust this, I've only one person, I want two people to be able to get compromised and they still can't do anything, whatever. Then you want three M plus one, M equals two, so you'd have seven. So it'd be five of seven, right? Or like, you know, uh, you know, seven of 10 or whatever, right? And so you kind of like scale, uh, sorry, yeah, seven of 10 or like three, right? As so you continue to scale this up as you go this one, but at some point you get to a point where it is third party custody, right? And the moment it gets to third party custody, well, now that's not something that I trust, right? I don't trust like some random dude who's like part of this like larger diaspora of people or whatever, right? Like maybe I like have like a thing for like Marine vets or whatever that I do or whatever, right? And like initially it's just like me, I like start this federation and I run out of BA or whatever. And so there's like a bunch of people in my local community and I'm like helping on board for them to fit one of these things. Like the way that I like to think about this in terms of how you do that is just like absolutely self custody is critical and this is like the way that you should be starting with these problems like you should absolutely take self custody your coins now start walking down the thought process of what happens if i'm in an accident or what happens if i lose my uh, lose my key or something like this right 
you need some sort of threshold backup solution. And so for you personally, maybe that's your friend, your wife, your parents, and somebody from work or whatever, right? Well, now all of them have this exact same problem, right? And so you can either do like custom role, a threshold multi-sig solution for every single one of them. Or if you guys are all going to be each other's threshold multi-sig anyway, well, okay, let's formalize this relationship and like we can establish a federation for these things. And then while you're having this, like now you're running into the problem of, oh, okay, well now I have this multi-sig solution, but what am I going to do on a day-to-day -day basis? I don't want to go talk to them every single time I want to pay, right? Well, maybe you want some sort of single sig claim against that underlying stuff that you're going to be able to do. What's the accounting system that you want to use for that one? Well, maybe I want to use e Xiaomi eCash. And the reason why is because in the event that they recover my funds, because of the blinded nature of Xiaomi eCash, the only thing that happens is they recover my funds. They don't see my entire payment history. But if I do a standard multi-sig wallet, they're going to recover. They're going to see the XPUB. They're going to see all my prior, uh, prior payments that I've ever done, right? So it's kind of like absolutely... Self-custody is absolutely something everybody should strive for. Start thinking through what happens in the event that you take self-custody. Start thinking through the problem of when we're going to be onboarding these millions and millions of people, the supply chains are not there to get them hardware wallets, and most people don't trust themselves with hardware wallets. What is an intermediate solution and design space that we can explore versus just doing third-party custody, which is the way they seem to be going right now when they uh, get onboarded, right? Got it, got it. Okay, so the way the way to think about when you might feel safe entering a federation is something like it's more of a gut check and yeah. it's like you enter a room and you go how it, so the threshold is something like 70 75 percent roughly on average that have to be malicious yep, for it to for it to cross over that's a rough yeah, number it's greater than two-thirds right <laughs> got it and uh so if i was thinking about you need it, to be like, honest sorry just I'm, to clarify for that one is that it's the technical one is that three m plus one where m is the number of malicious people Right. And so generally speaking, the way to think about that is that like you basically need two thirds to be honest or but if they compromise two thirds, then they can take the funds. The way that we built Fediment is using this asynchronous distributed system, uh, distributed uh, consensus system. Right. Where if one third is compromised between one third and two thirds, they can't take the funds, but they just can't progress forward in the protocol. Right. And so in order to compromise the funds, you need to compromise two thirds of people. Right is the way to think about the federation aspect of these things. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, so so then the way to think about it is you, you guys have built rock solid cryptography for the things you can build, but the way to think about it is like I enter a room or I I, I look at the you know the dean's list and who is in this federation. And I go, you know, do I trust giving them my wallet to two thirds of these people? If no, maybe don't enter it. If yes, you know, yep. cool. And if you're in the middle, maybe get to know them, involve yourself in the community. That that's kind of the way people should. Think about Fediment and entering Fediment Federation. Totally, totally. Is that there's going to be tens of thousands of these different federations, and like the moment that you have like uh, considerations or trade offs associated with like the size of one of them, or like that you're not close enough to socially sanction the people who are um, in that federation, uh, who are the guardians of that federation, it's like absolutely move into self custody, right? Then think about what happens in self custody. So okay, you move it back to the family federation that you're running, or you move it back to the community federation, or you move it back to the company federation, the nation federation. You kind of like move scale, 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 whatever you're comfortable with, right? One of the cool things about Fetty is that the way that we designed the app is that it's by its nature is that you're going to be crossing between multiple federations, right? So like when you open it up, it kind of looks like Slack channels, right? Of that you've got like the different federations that you're a part of, right? And it's just like one or two clicks in order to move money between these different federations. It's kind of, it's all automated as you're doing it, right? You see very good privacy as you do it as well. So. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a bridge thing. Okay. So then something else you mentioned is it's a modular framework, which yes. don't fully know that what that means. So I think of like Legos. So it's like you can attach things in different ways and you can- you Exactly. Know, and so I guess for, first question is like, how, how extensible is this? And then maybe attaching to that is like, does that mean that if there's things built on top, can something lower level be swapped out or like how, how much interplay is that? It's that's exactly the way that works. The, the image you should have in your head is Legos, right? Is that this module system, right? Cause the reason why is because when we originally, uh, when Eric was originally writing the system, um, he wanted to make things just kind of like for him personally, easier to think about. But this kind of evolved into this really robust module system, right? And so the default modules that ship with Fediment just out of the box are Bitcoin, Lightning, and eCash, right? And the reason why is because, like, unplug all of the modules, what is happening is there's just a distributed consensus system, right? And the distributed consensus system, in that, you have to define the items that they can perform consensus over. And the model in Fediment is that there's just transactions, is that there's inputs, there's outputs and there's a Schnorr signature, which is the um, cross input signature aggregation 
of all of the inputs, right? That the whole thing, the whole thing is built on this transaction structure. And so when you're defining a new module, what you're doing is you're defining new inputs, you're defining new outputs, and you're saying, for example, you can have lightning inputs and Bitcoin outputs. You can have eCash inputs and Bitcoin outputs. You can have lightning input and uh, solidity smart contract execution output, right? Of that, because you can define it in this way, you can do whatever you want, right? And so just as an example, there's like a very primitive contract system that comes out of the box with Fediment or whatever. Something that we'd be really excited to see and that um, uh, like probably people in the audience would be able to implement, right? Is like implementing something like Clarity or a more complex contracting system as a Fediment module, right? And so you basically like hot swap the contracting system out and then put this one, new one in. And then just out of the box, anything that you deployed on any of these uh, like stacks or whatever, right? Like you can bring that onto Bitcoin and like there's no derivative token in the way and all that kind of stuff, right? So like one of the things that we did, this was last year at Bitcoin Plus Plus, was we did simplicity. And so we called it SimpyMint. Is that just in general, all great modules end with eMint, right? And so um, for SimpyMint is imp implementing the simplicity smart contracting system within FediMint. So you unplug the, so what basically we did was, well, we didn't unplug the existing like contracting system, basically added resolution of simplicity contracts as this module, right? And so when you say, how extensible is this? Well, simplicity smart contracting system is that, Basically, anything that you can provide a security proof in C for, you can execute. So you can execute arbitrary C code through by the use of Jets, right? And so it's like, how extensible is this thing? Well, you can do whatever you want, right? As, like, as long as you can prove that the thing will finish execution before, um, uh, what's it called, you don't have any issue loops, right? But basically, that's kind of the idea behind it. And so for Clarity, for example, you could just like put, plug that in as a module, and now you've got inputs and you've got outputs, and you can define these things in different ways, right? So interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I'm gonna take a hard left turn then, and we're, we're, we're breezing up on an hour real quick, so, uh, we'll kind of, we'll start to close this down, but something you mentioned way earlier is, uh, a Chamian Mint, which is blind deposits, I think is what you said, and... Yeah, so basically the Chamian eCash Mint uses this cryptography primitive called blinded signatures, right? And the thing to keep in your mind is, um, basically this idea of, of that... When I show up at the mint with my Bitcoin or whatever that I'm depositing in there, right? I'm going to, well, we don't have to get into this one, but we actually do this in a really cool cool way where we make it so that when you deposit into the mint as uh, into the Fetty Mint, um, it's actually atomic with them giving you the eCash, right? Is that it's not possible for them to claim the deposit that you did unless they give you the eCash, right? Which is pretty cool, right? But um, basically the, the image that you should have here in mind is that when they're doing this eCash is that I show up with a bunch of eCash notes in envelopes. Right. And the only thing I can see about these basically is the amounts associated with these eCash notes. Okay. And so they know when I do the deposit that they're issuing me eCash notes of a certain amount. And so they push really, really hard on the envelope and they do the signature. And then what I do is I go off on my merry way. What I do the moment that I turn around is I throw away the envelopes, I copy the eCash notes out, and I put those in my wallet. Right. So now when I show back up, I have a bunch of eCash notes. They're not in the, on the envelopes, right? And so anything that the Federation saw was on the envelope. And that's thrown away. That they don't see anymore, right? I show back up with the eCash note, and you can see the negative of the signature on the eCash note. Because remember, like, they push really hard through the envelope. So like you can see the outline of their signature on this thing, right? So when I show back up at the, at the Mint, all they know is, yes, I did issue this at some point in the past. This is a valid eCash note, but I don't know which one it was. Right. Mm. That's kind of the fundamental cryptography primitive behind this, right? Where your anonymity set for everything in the Fetty Mint becomes all of the other eCash notes of that denomination ever issued by the Mint. Right. So it's like a very, very, very strong privacy pr uh, protocol. Right. And the reason why we'd want to do this is because when you're talking about local community custody, right, it's very important that when, uh, like, when my, uh, my local community, um, like, for example, I don't really care that, like, some third party in some far off place that I'm never going to admit. Is able to see my transactions in many uh, in many circumstances. I do care if, for example, I'm an activist working in some area that my my neighbor who is like doesn't like me or whatever doesn't see my transactions, right? And so this is something where it's not like the most important thing, right? Like the most important thing is this community custody thing. But like when you talk about like the local community, like having this element of privacy behind my transactions so that it's like you know my neighbor can't look over my shoulder and see what I'm doing, right? Because like a neighbor is the guardian, right? It is that you want to be able to have this uh, better privacy guarantee, right? And so okay. Charmian eCash is a technique for doing this. It's just a blinded accounting system, right? Where the mint can't knows they know that they're not issuing anymore. Well, they're trusting them not to issue anymore, but like this is the federation aspect of it, right? Is that you're depositing the mint, they're issuing it out. When you redeem the eCash notes, they can't correlate the input to the output, right? 
Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, I can understand the privacy aspect of it. Where, and again, like it's, this is all crypto, cryptographically sound, but the basic idea yep. is like, you know, you come in, you go, you know, cool, you came in through the right way, you, you pass through security, your wallet's good, we give you this money, and then after that, all all I know is that once you toss the envelope, is that this did come from this issuing bank. That's all we need to know. Exactly. This this is legit e-cash, so you you can spend it in the community as legal tender. Yep. And the process of spending it is that I tell somebody else about my e-cash note, right? They go to the mint, they redeem it, they get new e-cash, right? And now the one that I had previously has been invalidated, right? And so like, this is not a very, like the reason why this doesn't take off, right? Um, before you have Bitcoin and before you have a lightning network is because you're just stuck within your mint, right? But because we have the lightning gateways, right? Now we can have it, the experience and the, like the, the this is a design decision on, Bit, on um, Fediment's uh, part is that the experience that everyone has is they're just paying lightning invoices. Right, is like we actually hide the eCash behind. Like, you, if you're doing an offline payment, you can see it. But generally speaking, the experience is just that you're using Lightning. Right, it's just on the back end. There's some fancy cryptography happening that gives you really good privacy. Right. Got it. Okay. Uh, I got a few more questions. Yeah. Um, totally. let's, let's see here. So we've talked a lot about the benefits. Uh, you know, privacy. Uh, what, what are some of the big downsides? Or like limitations yeah. to fighting with the protocol. Yeah, totally. Right. Is that like very upfront about this, right? Is that like there is a trust assumption associated with this that is not if you're using base chain Bitcoin or if you're just using Lightning, right? Is that the trust assumption is based on the Federation, right? Is that Federation is your you're trusting it is like everything else is based off this thing, right? And so this is kind of just like a design space that we find interesting and that we think is should be explored and expanded. It's just because that is the fundamental difference between this and every other protocol right like all of the trustless stuff or whatever right but you're if you're willing to make this trust assumption there's all sorts of benefits that you get from this like for example the ability to do a social recovery right out of the box the ability to do something like chow mini cash like cryptographically perfect privacy out of the box the ability to be able to do hosted community resources because they're running these federations right as like all of these spaces that you get in, in terms of doing this trust assumption right and so that's just like a very specific one in terms of like all the benefits, all the, the downsides or whatever, like insofar as they are a downside, you do that. But the perspective that we take on this and the perspective that I think everybody should take on this, right, is that like a, you arrive back at that trust assumption the moment that you kind of think through what happens to my single sig cold storage um, in the event that I like something happens to me, right? And because you arrive back at this and you're going to have to do this in some way, it kind of gets a little bit complicated when you think about vaults, right? Because like for vaulting, right, is that you know, it, it kind of gets a little more complicated, but just generally speaking, right, is that this second party design space is trust assumptions that people are willing to explore. And like, I think it'll be very interesting once um, Ledger Recover actually continues as what they're doing right ever, because like the intuition behind what Ledger is doing there makes sense, right? Which is that there's a lot of people who are afraid to take self custody of their funds because they don't trust their, like their wife to be able to do the recovery by themselves afterward, right? And so the current solution that they have is that they're going to a third party. And the, the way that we should be comparing these things is on this perspective of like, hey, there's like this centralized custodian third party who's like, you achieve no privacy, they, they see everything or whatever, right? There's full self-sovereign, all these kinds of things or whatever, right? And there's design trade-offs associated with it. And this one, Fediment is a, uh, what's it called, is an interesting set of trade-offs within that design space between the two of those things that we think is going to be able to give a better solution to onboarding billions of people in the Bitcoin, right? Like just for example, just like the, the math behind this is that if we wanted to give everybody in the United States a lightning channel, it would be two years of full blocks, right? Of just opening the lightning channels, right? Uh, like none of the ordinal stuff, none of the inscriptions, none of the ZK rollups, none of those things or whatever is like two years of just opening lightning channels, right? The size of the UTXO set, if you want to scale out to on lightning layer to billions of people or whatever, explodes beyond anything that anybody could reasonably run themselves, right? So at some scaling point or whatever, you need to have some sort of way of doing uh, like a custodial solution around a UTXO where multiple people are splitting up internally the accounting of like that UTXO, right? The thing on chain is like one, a couple UTXOs or whatever. And that is the combined economic energy of tens or hundreds of people below it, right? That's the scaling solution that gets you to billions of people using Bitcoin, right? And of course, there's other ways you can do it. You can do rollups, you can do side chains, other things like that or whatever. Like Fediment is an interesting design trade-off where it's worth exploring and it's got this really extensible module system. So for example, if you wanted to do any of those other things that you're doing on these other chains, a good place that you could do is first implement them in Fediment. And so you can have that run in the distributed consensus among this smaller group 
to prove the cryptography, to prove the security, to prove the effectiveness of this thing, right? And then as it scales, as it gets better, because like really, like for a lot of the stuff that we really want to do in Bitcoin, there's not a real good training ground for it, right? The training grounds right now are like signets, right? Or like liquid. But like now through Fediment and this module system, you can go take whatever the most advanced cryptography stuff you want to do, start a federation with you and your other Bitcoiners, kick the tires on it, use real money behind it, right? And um, what's kind of like, as you prove it out, you scale up to larger and larger systems and eventually that gets software into Bitcoin, right? Got it. Man, that's a crazy stat. Two different transactions. And that's not that's not even factoring in cost and fees, which who knows where they'll be. So that's that's insane. Yeah, totally. Um the the federation piece, I I can't stop thinking about it now. And it's interesting because you have this this second party thing, which is a more social consensus, it's which is I like. And then but when you go one layer up, um, you know, no Bitcoin layer, if you will, has gotten real traction. And the three main ones I, Lightning is top of the heap, in my opinion. But then mm -hmm. you have Liquid and Rootstock, which do federations in their own way. And then you have Stacks, which is open membership, but you have to hold this this token that most people don't want to hold. So yeah, do you think that the Fediment second party model is fundamentally that much different than the other ones? Or because I that I, I can't get a good pulse on how different that yeah, is, even though you're explaining it well. It's really like the second party versus third party federations, right? Is that like for example, I mean, just like off the top of my head of like, when I use Liquid, the people that I'm trusting are people that I don't know, that don't know me, that don't know my kids, they don't know my family. Like, I like fundamentally, I think that there's like super beneficial in like all sorts of ways or whatever for these things or whatever. But it's just like, kind of think this through of just like the, the intuition behind Ledger Recover is correct, which is that there's a lot of people who don't feel fully comfortable themselves taking self-custody, right? And they want some sort of backup solution. And currently there is not an interesting design space for how they can do that, right? So even for all of these other things, right? So for example, I deposited Rootstock or whatever, right? And yeah, Rootstock has a federation side of those things, but like those federation members are not gonna collude together in order to recover my funds, right? <laughs> and so like, because of this third party system, right? And like for liquid side, like exact same thing or whatever, right? But like within the federation context of these things, it's like basically the, um, what's it called? You can scale this up and you get interesting trade-offs of the size of this thing. Like, so for example, if you're running a larger federation across a more distributed uh, set of places that is more resilient than more guardians being compromised or whatever, maybe that's something that if you're um, like a very privacy focused individual or you're in a, a government that's um, like not uh, like that's not welcoming to you in that place or whatever, that's the kind of federation you'd be interested in joining. But if you're just trying to do like a backup solution for myself, my family, my uh, local community or whatever, right? Then like maybe like the guardians are like in my local space. What Fediment aims to be is just this very modular protocol level in order to allow you to decide to make those trade-offs yourselves. And then Fedi is a way of on the front end, have a unified, like we call it a federated operating system of having a unified view of interacting with these different federations. So maybe there's the community one, maybe there's the company one, maybe there's the nation one, maybe there's the local family one or whatever. Maybe there's one that offers like really good AI models that are like they're hosting because they have like a GPU graph, uh, they have like a graphics card farm or whatever, right? And so like my local AI that's running on my phone, once it runs, uh, realizes that it's facing a problem or I've asked it to do something that it can't solve on its own, it has a little bit of eCash that it can use to make lightning payments in order to purchase access for model storage and federation, those kinds of things, right? Is that it's just a very interesting design space. And th like you were saying, of like, hey, I can't stop thinking about this thing is that for once you start thinking about it this way, like it really takes over everything. It's like, it's very hard to think about other things. Like everything else is interesting or whatever, but this is like very interesting design space of the possibilities that emerge when you're, because you recognize that people are willing to make these trust assumptions on certain aspects of things. And the moment that they're not able to absolutely like fork off your own federation, go use some other solution or whatever. Right. But like, this is like an interesting design space because we can use it as a technique for onboarding millions and millions and millions of people. Right. Because, uh, yeah. Got it. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, I guess the last question that we'll have to bring us to a close. If people are hearing this, you know, super interested, you guys just launched Fedi Alpha. Is that the best place? I guess first tell us a little about it, but where's the best place to interact with Fedi kind of at the bleeding edge? Not the, not like I want to build, but I want to yeah. like try it out as an end user. Yeah, well, there's uh, there's two things specifically, right? And so there's the Fediment module layer, which we spent a lot of time talking about, right? And that's kind of like consensus layer, distributed systems, that kind of thing, right? And so if you're somebody who like writes clarity smart contracts or if you're writing on like working on Taproot or anything like that, right? Like that's kind of like join the Fediment Discord, start contributing to the open source protocol for it. We do all sorts of really fun stuff. 
right? Um, like all like kind of bleeding edge Bitcoin stuff like happens at Fedman, right? Like we're using Miniscript, we use Taproot, we use um, crossing for signature aggregation, like fancy stuff with the Schnorr signatures, adapter signatures, all um, that kind of things. Like all through the Fedman module system, you can do interesting smart contracts and all that kind of stuff, right? Like all the stuff that you might think about like, oh, hey, I can't do this on Bitcoin or whatever. You absolutely can. And the place to test it is in Fedman, right? And so come like to Fedman, do that sort of thing. If you're like a web dev or some sort of front end dev or anything like that, Fetty has this concept of Fetty mods, which is basically WebLN enabled sites that become interoperable with the Federation Fediment APIs, right? And so now it's like, hey, I'm interacting with um, websites that are like lightning enabled, right? But I can also do stuff like I can use the resources on my Federation when I'm doing these things, right? So it's like, oh, hey, I got a lightning invoice, I have to log in with lightning or I have to do something like this, right? But like also tying in the APIs that are opened up by the federations that you're connected to, right? This concept of Fetty mods, it's very kind of just like, hey, building front-end applications that use WebLN, but also leveraging the fact that we've got all these federation resources behind us, right? Connected through the Fetty app, right? And so for those ones, um, for just like all of this kind of stuff generally is that Fetty is going to be sponsoring like a giant hackathon for its remote first um, for the entire month of July called AI for All. And kind of the thesis behind it is that like, Bitcoin is a tool for enabling access to bleeding edge AI stuff to the rest of the world, right? And the reason why is because as a sender on Bitcoin using the Lightning Network, right? Um, uh, for So if I'm like hosting like an AI model or anything like that, right? Is that I can give access to this for everyone in the world. And the, you can't do that right now. The reason why is because people will find it, they'll exploit it, they'll, uh, what's it called? they'll take advantage of all your GPT access. They'll take advantage of the fact that you've got all these graphics cards or whatever. You can't just open it up, right? But with Lightning, we have instant micropayments, right? And as the sender, you achieve perfect privacy. And so as people, I can open up access to like my graphics cards. I can open up access to like my GPT enabled model, or I can make a website and I can put a GPT chat on it or whatever, right? And instead of waking up the next day with a $250,000 bill because somebody figured out I was using GPT-4 and they're just spamming me, right? Is that I could say like, hey, you have to pay per API call that you're doing. And because it's lightning, it's instant final settlement and the sender achieves perfect privacy. I achieve no information about my user except for the fact they paid me, right? And so I'm always profitable the moment that I deploy my AI application. And so it's really excited for that one is that all of through the month of July is that we're going to be doing like tons of like rep replica bounties, hackathon prizes, like bunch of building workshops and all this kind of stuff of using Bitcoin as a tool for democratizing AI access, right? And it's going to be remote first. There's going to be like a culminate, we're going to have like some in-person events kind of all around the world or whatever. So just like meet Bitcoin builders and all that kind of stuff, right? So like keep an eye out for all those things. Love it. And is the Fetty Discord the best place to, to be pointing towards that? Uh, Fetty has a Telegram. Fetty has a Telegram. Um, Fetty Mint has a Discord. And so there's a Fetty Telegram uh, where we kind of answer questions about uh, the Fetty Alpha stuff. It is that if you just go um, fetty.xyc slash builders, then that's a good place to like start getting uh, getting uh, started using um, uh, the uh, Fetty Alpha. And uh, so that's a progressive web app. It's also got an iOS app and a um, uh, Android app and an APK. And so like you can use it on whatever system you're working on. It uses the mutiny signet and there's going to be over the next couple of weeks, there's going to be a tons and tons and tons of new support for different tooling and stuff. Like, so for example, mutiny, which is like a privacy focused lightning wallet uses the mutiny signet. We use the same signet. And so you can like pass around payments between those two or whatever, like on the mutiny side, if you're like more advanced, you can see like lightning channels, those kinds of things and see how it's like basically passing it back and forth between like the eCash system and the lightning system. It's very cool. Um, there's going to be tons and tons of stuff coming out like, a um, yeah. But so that's the place to go. Fetty.xyc slash builders. Love it. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions I got. I think you you dropped bombs for like an hour straight successfully. Uh, yep. a, any other closing thoughts that of questions I didn't answer or didn't ask? Yeah. I mean, just like kind of two things for it, right? Is that so one of the things that I've kind of learned of working on Fetty and Fettyment, right? Is that there's like an entire world out there who needs access to this stuff. Is that they need Bitcoin. And like... The thing that needs to happen right now is people need to help build the tools that is going to democratize access to this stuff, right? And so, like, I mean, I talked about the patent quote earlier, right? Of like, hey, like the thing that I'm offering you is 30 years from now when you're talking to your grandkids, like you'll get to tell them that I helped bring, uh, like, you know, I helped bring peace to Europe, right? Um, by working with the Third Army. On the Bitcoin side of things, right, is that like we're in this really critical moment right now where things could go one of a couple different ways. And like 30 years from now, when you're talking about your, when you're talking with your kids, you're talking to grandkids and they ask you, what were you doing during this period where we brought property rights to billions of people around the world? You get to say, Hey, I helped build the software that did that. I helped build the tools that did that. I helped bring, uh, bring property rights to these people. Right. Is like, that's the way to think about this thing. 
Well, well said. Yeah, the more time I spend, again, it feels like coming up for air in some sense. But the more you get orange pilled, the more you're like, I, I, I like crypto still. Like, there's a lot of value in crypto. I'm not like a Bitcoin maxi per se, but a lot of what they're building is like weird rehypothecation and like you know speculative token things. So there's something about that what you just said of make enough money to live your life. You know, everyone deserves to be comfortable, but you're building something that's like literally world changing and yep. it's still super duper duper early. And the need for people to have that mindset and just build in one direction, like unified. Uh, you feel like back on this and be proud of yourself for the fact that you, you did like you brought property rights to, you know, a huge swath of the population that had no chance before Bitcoin. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is like kind of kind of last 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 word on this one for um for devs, right? Is that in terms of like I like I know this from the dev perspective because like I was this guy for a little bit, right? Was that um you feel like you're doing work by doing things like reading about coding or like going to a conference or whatever where it's not a hackathon where you're actually coding, but it's like hey, I'm talking about coding or whatever, right? Or like reading books, reading books is a big one, right? Like reading coding books and um, just like kind of doing like fake work for these things is that the thing that you need to be doing and the thing that everybody should be striving to do, right? Is that you sit down in front of a computer and you try to build software that are going to help people, right? Is that you build software that either gets reviewed by someone more senior than you so you can learn through making mistakes or you build through building something that a user is going to use and so the user can give you feedback on what you did. Right. And like, that's the fastest way. Like it hurts. It's hard. Sometimes you feel like you can't build, um, something that's useful or whatever, but everyone here, everyone is here to help you. It's like, we're kind of like in this ship, we're all rowing the boat toward property rights and freedom. Right. And there's like, you know, you can like be there, you can pick up an order and you can kind of join in and everyone's very excited for you, but, or you can kind of like, you know, like take pictures of the boat or something like that. I don't know. I mean, like that analogy kind of broke down. Right. But it's just like, um, like this is just something that like the thing that comes to my mind, right? Is that um just kind of going back to Marine Corps side of things, right? Is that there's like um there's this whole like industry of people who kind of like take advantage of Marines, right? And uh, people in the military, where it's like you know they like for, let me tell you about one of the like most egregious ones is that there's guys who like they uh, sell cars or whatever, right? And like they will figure out when the graduating classes of Marines are coming off Paris Island or um like the Hollywood Marines out of San Diego. Um, like they'll figure out when they're graduating and then they'll position themselves so they have a specific sale so for those guys when they're coming out because they know that they're sitting on a stack of cash. It's the first time they've ever made any money because they've been stuck on Paris Island for a couple months, right? And so they're sitting on a government paycheck that's been going through it or whatever. They basically calculate the amount that like, oh, hey, I'll be able to get 30% of the money that he's got on these things or whatever. And then like the Marines come off, they go buy the hot rod car, they get this giant like car payment that they have to do or whatever and it, like totally screws them or whatever, right? And like that's something that's absolutely you're capable of doing in a free market, right? But it's also kind of distasteful, right? And like, do you want to be that guy? Oh, it's like, yes, absolutely. Like Bitcoin is freedom technology. It's freedom, it's money for your enemies. It's all that sort of thing or whatever, right? It's like 30 years from now, do you want to be the guy who is like, oh, hey, like I just played with this little toy or whatever, right? Or do you want to be the guy who can say to your grandkids, like, hey, I help bring property rights to billions of people and build software that everyone else is using. And like everyone in the industry wants you to be that guy. Everybody is here to help you. Like. If you like, come to the Fediment Discord, like we do new contributor onboarding all the time, like come to Bitcoin Plus Plus, come participate in the hackathon or whatever. Like all we want is more devs and we are all here to help you, right? So, well said. Yeah, I'll just double click on that because one of my big uh, passions with this podcast is trying to break down talking to the builders. And the reason why I spend half the time talking about the person for the most part and then talking about the project. Because I'm trying to humanize the fact that like we're all just people trying to build stuff. It's not Bitcoin feels inaccessible at some level if you're new. It feels very high and mighty, um, but you drop so many ways of why it, it's it's the barriers easier than you think. And you know, two years ago I was working at a grocery store. Now I work full time. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in Bitcoin, and it's like I spent a lot of time doing the mental bas masturbation of like YouTube videos and you know tutorials and stuff versus I've probably spent 200 hours learning to code. I'm still a terrible coder. I spent most of my time doing this like and talking to startups. But at first, it's really hard to get over the fact that the computer is like, the computer is never wrong. It's your code that's mm -hmm. wrong. And at first, that's really frustrating. The more you do it, the more it's freeing. Where it's like, I, I, it's, I'm the problem. 
once I get it right, I can crack it and like the computer is going to spit out the thing I need. That become as you get more cycles in, it becomes really alluring. So that's just a little preamble or whatever of, to b pick off back what you said of like, if you're thinking about it, we've dropped some pretty good resources. Take advantage of them uh, and your life could change quicker than you think. And you can also help mm -hmm. a bunch of people. So uh, yeah, Cody, this has been a fantastic episode. I'm going to have a billion clips to cut out of this to post online. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on to drop knowledge about Bitcoin dev development and Fediment and everything else. Appreciate you. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. This has been great. Thanks. Thank you for listening this far into the episode. If you found it enjoyable, please do like, subscribe on whatever platform that you're listening on. YouTube does me a huge favor to like and subscribe. Find me on Twitter at Jake Blockchain. Show me some love. I reply to every DM. And if you are a Bitcoin builder that is kind of at the forefront of building new use cases, whether it's L1, Lightning, Stacks, Rootstock, Rollups, Ordinals, BRC20, uh, I want to talk to you. So when I'm not doing this podcast, I am the sourcing partner at the Bitcoin Frontier Fund, where we invest in Bitcoin startups at the earliest stages, give you access to whatever you need, whether it's legal, product, fundraising help, as well as capital. So love to talk to you. You can hit me up again. Find me on Twitter at Jake Blockchain and uh, shoot me a DM. Uh, I'll read everything. Love to talk to you guys. All right. Peace. <laughs>